welcome Jan Heidelberger. So everyone, please meet Jan. Because um, I'm very, I'm, I'm extraordinarily honored because this topic we're going to talk about here today is um, highly important to me and many of us, and I think also you. And if it's not, it should be. Because you may have thought about this or not, um, you can actually change quite a few things in your workflow as a researcher as well to make this world a better place directly and indirectly, and especially with regards to climate change. Um, I think the message has come across that each of us can do our parts. And you might think, yeah, I can do so much at home. You're probably already riding your bike to work, to the lab, to the research institute, the university, um, or take public transport, all of that. So, But also in the lab, you might think, well, there's nothing I can change because research is just waste wasteful. Let me tell you, it hasn't always been that way. Also, it doesn't have to stay that way. And Jan is here to share with us what him and his team at the Max Planck Sustainability Network have put together in guidelines, have learned from other initiatives, groups, professionals, experts, in what the research and academia sector can do to reduce the impact and mitigate climate change. So welcome, Jan. It's a pleasure to have, have, for having you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, yeah, really happy to to be here. Actually, it's the very first time I'm doing a podcast. So uh, yeah, it's also a, a nice, nice uh, way of sharing some things and experiencing this new method and way of, of, of communicating. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to share some of my insights and some of my, my story, my path, and um, some ideas uh, we're working on actually in my, my free time, so besides my job. So maybe just to start with my background, if you like, and give some 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 ideas of where I'm coming from and where I'm now. Yes, please. Yeah, tell us about your journey as a researcher, where, like, yeah, where you're coming from, where, where you're headed, what's your research topic? And why are you concerned and, and active in sustainability and academia in the broader sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, I started studying biochemistry in Frankfurt am Main and um, yeah, did there my studies. And after this, I changed, or I decided to do my PhD. I changed uh, the institute. I went to the Institute of Molecular Biology in Mainz, uh, was working there. Uh, with mass spectrometry, working on post-translational modifications. Um, and this is also where my passion for sustainability in science started. Because um, I was already starting um, to work um, yeah, on sustainability in my private uh, time, on what can I do in my private life to reduce my carbon footprint. I was reading some publications, thinking of, OK, how can I change my shopping behaviors, my energy consumption, and all these kind of things, but continue to, to go to the lab every day, putting all my, my, my experiments together, wasting a lot of uh, plastics, producing tons of waste. It's probably what most scientists, especially in a <clears throat> biological context, fought over the easiest is all the waste they're producing. Um, but for a long time, I was not thinking about it. At home, I was trying to sort my waste, looking for everything, going back to uh, to work and producing a lot of waste. And, and then at some point, a colleague wrote an email, hey, how about we meet and talk about sustainability in science um, when what we can do in the Institute. And that's where I got caught, uh, where we started a green initiative at my previous Institute and where I got interested in the topic. Then after this, uh, I changed gears. I went to um, scientific management. This is where I'm currently working for the Max Planck School of Matter to Life uh, as a scientific coordinator. So it's a graduate program where I'm coordinating all different kinds of stakeholders, the students, the professors, mm. and all the structure of the school. But still, Wait, I'm keeping... This... Yeah. left active research. Do you miss that? Uh, <laughs> so, so far, I'm really... Um, I mean, I, I don't do active research anymore. That's completely true. So far, I'm not completely, I mean, I'm not missing it. So far, I really love interacting with the scientists okay. still, managing the scientists, getting in, in interaction with them and, and dealing with them, um, but don't standing all the day on the bench myself. Yeah, I, I, I hate that pipetting, and we're going to talk about the actual pipetting exercise a bit more because of the ways that comes with it, but... 
I just didn't occur to me how that's useful. <laughs> I mean, yes, with reproducibility and replicability, of course, but it's so boring and repetitive. And I think that's the most daunting part about research, which most people are not researchers don't know about. Like it's just so boring and repetitive. And that's the the least pleasure I can find in anything to keep myself busy with in this lifetime. Like, no, <laughs> it wasn't for me. But then to analyze the data, I mean, that's, and now I can analyze the data and, or other data, but to analyze the bioscience data that I did in my, during my PhD, could have done this forever. Like, so exciting to, yeah, to, to, so yes, I miss, I miss being a biology researcher or evolutionary molecular biology. I miss that. And I'm glad I still, I'm still in touch with those who do the work. And I sometimes mm -hmm. listen with like a huge ear, like, what are you working on? And what methods are you using? Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so that's how hard it is for me. But I've been 10 years, 12 years now out of the lab. So it's wow. becoming more and more of an emotional experience when I see research equipment and all of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So as as no, I think everybody needs to find kind of their niche, right? And what they like. Um, and for me, it's the interaction with the scientists and really, I mean, science is still cool and super interesting and a lot of people really enjoy being in the lab and doing experiments and I admire this, but I figured out it's not for me. I like to work with the people and exchange and um, getting people excited in that way. And this is more my thing. And I think what I found now being the scientific management is a nice bridging thing of still being connected with the science. But I don't have to do it myself. That's that's absolutely fine. I'll leave that to other people who have more, more passion about this. You know? So I think that's a nice, nice, nice thing. Yeah. And maybe yeah, to continue, then I, I, I switched to the Max Planck School, wanted to deal, still work on um, sustainability in research and found the Max Planck Sustainability Network. I mean, I was already in contact with some of the people before, but then I really became active a member and also was then um, elected to be part of the steering committee. So the steering committee of the Max Planck Sustainability Network um, is a group of five people who are kind of this uh, yeah, committee that represents the Max Planck Sustainability Network towards the admission, administration of the Max Planck Society and also outside of the Max Planck Society, interacting with other networks in Germany, in Europe, in the world, connecting, uh, organizing events, um, and all these kind of things. So by now, the Max Planck I've been in a, I, I was also on that. No, was I, I was not on the steering committee, but I was. I was heading one of the working groups of the PhD network. Oh yeah, yeah, so, cool. So yeah, it's we're colleagues. Cool right? yeah. 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> so now, I mean, the network has now more than uh, forty sustainability groups at the individual institutes, right? doing their measures at their institute, doing changes there. Um, and the steering committee is, so to say, on top, coordinating this more on the really Max Planck uh, level. But it's not a not a direct part of I mean, it's really um, a workers. I mean, it's a grassroots initiative, right? It's really from the people working in the, in the Max Planck Society um, on all different kind of levels in the lab, in the administration, all as a group leader, as a um, as a manager, as a, a technician, PhD, postdocs, all these kind of people. And that's also, I think, what is important for these kind of networks, right? Because everybody has different needs, different knowledges, does different things also on the different institutes, right? Not each institute is the same. Some do biology, some physics, some chemistry. There's also Max Planck Institute for law and so on, right? And they all have different things they're working on, different needs, and but all of them, can do something to improve the sustainability of their institutes. And that's what we're trying uh, to get the groups together, talking about exchanging, getting ideas and knowing that they're not alone, right? It's, uh, yeah, it's something we're all interested in. We're all trying to thrive forward and change something together. I really just appreciate the fact because I love that so much about the PhD net because it just pointed out how all the disciplines that the Max Planck Society represents basically across the whole spectrum come together and they are all in their PhD kind of level. So they're motivated, they're passionate about their research, they're passionate about the working group topics. Um, some are a bit disillusionized by, by the 
by the system, whatever the system is. By the way, we are the system now. But, <laughs> and we're here to change it, which is why we talk about climate related topics and sustainability. So, also the, yeah. So, um, let's get to work. So, um, the thing with the inter interdisciplinarity aspect of, or basically that's what I felt research should also be to deliberately bring people from different fields together. And I think in some research projects that is actually the case and happening, but I wish we would see so much more of that. And also the systemic approach that the PhD net is not taking with the working groups which is also a natural approach from the needs. And the, I think this can also be applied in research more strategically, but that's a whole other conversation to have. But, but I wanted to just, I was reminded by what you said, um, still in your introduction, but the, the, yeah, the different disciplines coming together as researchers with talking about a shared topic and then approaching, I think, what did you already have a working group of, about sustainability at this point or was that later? So I already doing my PhD, we started this group, right? And this was among oh, okay. the PhDs, right? Um, but at an early stage, we realized, okay, we really need to get the Institute on board and to talk also with the, the managers, the directors, the group leaders, um, and then started, I mean, from this small group of PhDs to reintegrate everyone in the Institute interested in sustainability, right? Oh, and get really the other relationships about that topic that you brought to the table. Sorry, once more. How, how interested or how easy was it to convince them of the importance of your topic, the sustainability mm -hmm. at the time? Mm -hmm. This always depends a little, right? I mean, the, the people understood the need and that they want to do something and they supported us right so they were like okay if you're you want to do that go for it but they were at the beginning a little skeptic there are these students they want to change stuff right um they want to do it different than it is been done all the time and how it is working and running um so they were a little skeptical but then when we started doing things we then introduced some new ways of um yeah, treating the waste system and so on and, and start talking to the people and making them aware of, we actually just want to discuss and see what can we do together and achieve, right, for all the different aspects. Mm -hmm. So it was a little little of a, of a journey and getting the people, you need to see, right, you need to make aware that you're not just want to point on people and say like, you should not, you should not, you should do that. Mm -hmm. It's more like, let's get into a discussion and let's see I mean, also like like monitoring, monitoring what is our institute actually doing? How is it doing, right? What is actually our impact? Mm -hmm. And then finding spots where we can do and change something. And then ideally also see afterwards, now we implemented this, can we measure the change we did? Yes. And of course it's also rewarding, right? And what we also did was then setting up um, a lecture series, right? So that we shared this passion and invited people. I got to, got to know a lot of people due to this, right? So all there's there's people at all kinds of institutes all over the world who are interested in doing something, changing something in their lab work, right? And this was a great opportunity to really find them, to get together, to exchange and to learn and not to invent the wheel every time the same. And this is also what we're trying to do a little in the network, right? So we set up a wiki, we set up uh, this care catalog, it's called so the catalog of recommendations, but we collected more than 30 ideas, how you can make your Max Planck Institute more sustainable. And in the end, we published this, so it's openly available. So not just because a lot of these things are not just bound to the Max Planck Institute, but you can just do it on whatever institute, right? Some more, some less, depending on what kind of institute you have, but a lot of the things. And then of course, it's interesting, what can I do in my lab? What can I do in my institute? Because I mean, if I'm just working on the desk, I, I don't care about pipetting. I don't care about the plastic waste so much because I'm just on my computer programming or uh, sending emails or whatever. But in each of these stages, there is something I can do to reduce my footprint. Brilliant. And um, yeah, so also, by the way, because you already mentioned a few sources, we put all of these into the show notes. And so by the time you hear this, they will be discoverable, accessible. So you can read all the details and explore this topic further, but we'd like to hear more from you while we still have you. Um, 
so yeah so we have okay so then yeah how how is this now unfolding so what are you what is the network doing how many people are you in the team or are we jumping too far ahead from where we've been no that's all fine so i mean in the steering committee we are the, the five members we meet on a uh, bi-weekly uh, manner to discuss what's currently going on. And then we also started exchanging with the general administration. We see how can we connect with the groups. We have a, an annual meeting where we, we meet all people from the uh, who are interested and who have time, right? Um, we do this now on a, on a hybrid base so everybody can join in person or online, right? Also in this way, facilitating uh, the exchange. And what do we do? I mean, we, we, we have this, this catalog and what we did now, for example, uh, we did a survey on what institutes are already doing and what they're implementing mm -hmm. in order to then make sure that if one institute thinks about doing something but has no clue how, then another institute is already doing it, they can exchange and find a way to get do it together. Or, for example, since last year, um, all flights are compensated, um, which are done because also scientific uh, research is really flight heavy for conferences, for meetings, for all these kind of things, right? So what we recommend in our catalog, for example, is that of course, as much as you can reduce flights, this is the best, right? If you're not flying, this has the biggest impact, mm -hmm. right? So uh, find a way to reduce your flights or not flying, but taking the train or a different kind of public transport. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good way of redu reducing it at least, right? Um, or if none of this is possible then at least to compensate and to find a way to do this right so this is what we're we're recommending there and trying to find out right. and it's also well, known as offsetting right it's the same it's offset yeah exactly it's the same right but it, also there you need to see how are you offsetting how are you compensating right um oh, with a society with a max Planck. sorry what's the offsetting approach that a max Planck mm -hmm. society we have a collaboration with atmosphere okay yeah, so um, sorry, I'm gonna add their link to the show notes. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On it. Um, it's a German company though, or a German organization, right? I think so. Yeah, to my knowledge, but this, yeah, don't quote me on this. <laughs> I think so. I think with all the information, all the different projects they're also supporting, mm -hmm. they're also now um, trying to um, do more sustainable fuel, right? So they have, there are some, some investigations going on and some, some innovations trying to trigger. Yeah, I um, think they've been working with Lufthansa on this. Lufthansa is basically leading the way on that, I heard. Uh, 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 my brother's, uh, a friend of one of my brothers has, is working in management at Lufthansa. So that's how I know. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, then you know better than I do. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, that's all I know. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I, I, miss, I mean, it's always whenever you do something sustainable, right? You can have these three R's or even more R's in your head, right? Can I reduce? Can I reuse or recycle? Can I um, do there something in order to affect my footprint, right? So mm -hmm. uh, in this case, of course, always the best thing is reducing. It's also for for conferencing, right? That's why, for example, we're also trying to investigate and see what kind of new modern, I mean, the, the COVID area showed, right? A lot of things can move online and then have a way lower footprint. So why not keeping some of these things? Right? You don't need to meet in person all the time, but sometimes it's nice to meet in person and has also its its benefits, right? So, But maybe we can have a hybrid thing, right? So that people who have not the opportunity to travel or would travel a long way just for giving one brief talk and then would travel all the way back. Maybe we can just have them online with us or something we're, uh, what, what I'm currently trying to do with the school, it's, it's a new approach, it's called multi-hub events, right? So that you have one event on multiple locations at the same time, right? So that you meet on these locations and people have less oh, yeah. travel uh, to come to these locations. And then they are, uh, the, the, the talks are in person on the one spot and, uh, streamed on the other location and vice versa, right? And you can have social events and you can exchange, right? And this you can even do cross borders, cross uh, time zones and so on. You just need to see while, um, yeah, starting the event that you make sure that all the needs of your, your, your different stakeholders, your participants are met, right? And you give mm -hmm. them, of course, this is more inclusive. This is cheaper in a way. I mean, it's for, for the, 
for the organization, it can be a little more tricky because you need to see all these different things. You need to get some experiences, but then it can have so much benefits on the other hand, right? Also, if you don't have the money to travel to the conference, it might be nice if you have the opportunity to at least participate online and to see some things or to have less travel going on and you can do so many things. And I think this is something we're just starting to experience with, right? And to experimenting with mm -hmm. and to find new ways of connecting and getting people together, right? Also find new collaborations and, and see what's, what's possible in the end. Exciting, that's so cool. And I, I remember the format is not new. I've seen it here and there with some, so Falling Walls is a Berlin-based initiative. They also have satellite events before the big event and it basically works like the way you just explained. So it's something that any consortium can really easily adopt, like especially research consortia where you have more than one person on one location and then just follow what you just described. Is there, yeah. so maybe we can point also in the blog post mm -hmm. in, or the show notes, you can point people to uh, like how to organize something like that or what to think about as you as you plan for su such a, what is that, hub, multi-hub event? Yeah. So yeah, it's something I think everybody, I mean, it's still, I mean, it's not new, new, as you say, right? But it's also something still not like the common sense, right? Like, okay, I'll do my events. So I need a location. I need a caterer. I need the speakers. Let's go for it, right? It's really something you need to find. There's there's some publications on this by now also. And so, um, yeah, this I definitely put in the show notes. Okay. Um, and it's something interesting to experience and to to, to try out and mm -hmm. to think new. Huh? And, yeah, okay, so now from, from these events and also from your own research on topic, which are the disciplines? I mean, you basically already said it earlier, like it's biosciences and all the lab heavy work in mm -hmm. research in academia, but like where do we have the biggest footprint on our planet? Where do we put most pressure in research? Um, yeah, I would say it's a difficult question, but let's say like this, right? I mean, every institution every dis different research discipline has their own big footprints, right? So there was a study by the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, and they found that, for example, 40% of their footprint is due to travel. Uh, they have to travel a lot, a lot of the, the big microscopes and, um, I mean, astronomic... Uh, um, but so what, now we're talking not only shipping people, but actually shipping or flying over microscopes and equipment that's like massive. No, no, no. Also, the people flying, right? Oh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. besides <laughs> building, building an institute itself, uh, running facilities. I mean, for example, if you are okay. in a biological lab, if you have cell cultures, if you have minus eighty freezers and stuff like this, right? I mean, I, I find it always, yeah, stunning again when you realize one of these minus eighty ultra low temperature freezer uses as much energy as a small household. Right, and uh, this is something, or the the whole air exchange rates, right? This is also something super high energy efficient. I mean, needs a lot of energy. If you do super uh, high resolution calculations on your computers and stuff like this, all the, the 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 power that your computer consumes and all these things, right? I mean, it's really really massive things. So, it's energy is definitely a thing, right? In the lab, of course, you're also consuming a lot of water. So if you have distilled water, uh, if you think about the process, how how you're deionizing water and stuff like this, mm -hmm. you you need to think for for one liter of uh, this deionized water, you need about three to five liters of tap water, right? The rest is just wasted, um, and all these kind of things, right? So you need to think twice. Okay, do I need now deionize water or not? And all these kind of things. What can I do? All these, all the plastic waste, all the, all the, the things happening there. Can I? There is a nice publication from a microbiology lab. They were doing a colony forming assay, um, and they showed how, um, with different ways of doing the experiment, right, um, how they can minimize the amount of equipment and resources they needed for the same experiment, right, getting the same results, because of course in the lab you can do a lot of things, but you always, the most important thing is, of course, the quality of your research, that this doesn't get infected, right? Because it doesn't help me when I do the experiment more sustainable, but then I have to do it twice or three times, right? Then nothing is one. So I need to make sure the quality is still the same. And of course, safety, right? I mean, talking about the air that circulates in the lab, 
um, you need to make sure that still the safety conditions are met, right? So of course, there are some, some guidelines that you need to have an uh, eight times air um, exchange within one hour, but this depends on the room you're actually using, right? So if I'm accessing um, the room and the risks, what is in the room? How is uh, everything there? Do I really need eight times the exchange? Um, do I need that 24 seven? Um, and all these kind of things, right? And then you can see, okay, maybe I can reduce that. And also thereby, of course, um, costs are reduced, right? Um, sometimes it needs some initial investment, but most of the time this pays off after a while, right? Also, like if you put solar panels on your, your institute, um, this can reduce your energy, but of course you need to buy the solar panels first. Um, so you need that to see also- actually a few years, but if you think about as a, as a director of an institute, if you yeah. think long term and beyond your own term as director, or maybe within, because I think it's a lifetime um, employment position. So uh, at least at Max Planck it is. I'm not sure about other places, but anyway. So so yeah, it's it's surely worthwhile. And I I think I recently learned um, by showing some of uh, seeing some of your updates. Was it yours or Kerstin's? Was a colleague who's coming on the show a little bit? um for the next one uh, so about the freezers if i think a common practice most bio samples if you want to preserve them through by free through freezing they they're still good with minus 70 and that saves i think 40 or 30 percent energy right or something like yeah that. i mean it depends always on the freezer you're using right the newer yeah, okay. ones a little better, um, but still, I mean, there's a lot of research done for, for these samples that they stay fine. There's a big freezer challenge for Migraine Labs. They're just starting this now in January, relaunched. So if you want, want to do the freezer challenge, uh, go ahead on their website and try it out. Okay. But um, they, they show definitely, I mean, 20 to 30% of energy you can save, um, depending on the freezer you're using and all this kind of stuff. And most of the samples are absolutely fine, right? And if you're afraid of your samples might not be fine, maybe if you have, I mean, every institute has more than just one minus 80 freezer, just from my experience, right? I mean, there might be somewhere it's not the case, but most of them definitely do. So uh, you can keep some of them on minus 80, you switch some on minus 70, and you can split your samples and you can see, right? And you have still some you can come back to, but you're already saving on, I don't know, let's say you have 10, you do five and five on five of these freezers, you're saving 20 to 30% of the energy. And I think that's worthwhile trying. And all these things, right? I mean, also uh, defrosting your freezer occasionally, making sure yeah, that you sort your samples, you sort your samples, you know where your samples are, because uh, the shorter I need to open the door before I close it again, the less energy is needed in order to get down to the temperature again. Right? And for so, that, I saw that in some labs, we didn't have that, or some, maybe we did, I can't remember. So to have an actual legend or some, I don't know, like a piece of paper mm -hmm. at, on the freezer door, which indicates where what sample is. And you have to maintain that, obviously, if you take a sample out and it's getting out of stock, just mark that on that thing. But, so that's an easy way to just mm -hmm. do it quick and easy and nice, like quick and nice, nice and quick. Um, open the door, get the sample, close again, instead of standing there for like 10 minutes. Where was my sample? And why didn't I label it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or changing also the filters frequently and all these kind of stuff. Where do I put my minus 80 freezers? Maybe not next to the incubator who's running at, I don't know, 37 degrees and stuff like this, right? And so it's a little thinking on, and checking, right? And also, I mean, like I said, in the night, on the weekend, when there's no people or less people, do I really need all these things running? switching oh. things off it's an easy thing right put a sticker a reminder. Off, not a good idea but you know, Maybe, yeah, yeah don't don't switch off your freezer <laughs> but you can switch off your centrifuge you don't need to have the yeah. pcr machine standing all night long on four degrees right all these kind of things uh, it's also stable at 12 degrees or you finish your experiment before uh, or starting it the next day right all these kind of things can can save so that Energy. sounds also like, I was thinking like, who's responsible for that? Should it be the PhD student? Is there a lab assistant or a lab manager? Because also the team consistency or the setup of a team and the, the staff in a research institution differs. But I mean, so it's, it's a question of team management 
coordination, mm -hmm. communication, and um, strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely a mix of all these things, right? And I mean, also of education, right? Because if I learn how I can do my experiment more efficiently already during internships, during my studies and all these kind of things, right? Then I have a feeling for it and I have an awareness. And this is the most important point, right? Did you get aware of this and think about the things you're doing? Like the, like the, the people in the microbiology lab did in their study. If I think about how do I do my experiment, how do I do it efficiently, right? Then I can also do, I mean, first of all, I can do bulk orders because I thought about it ahead. What do I need? I can maybe pool with others. What do we need to order? And we do one order and not five times and I need it by tomorrow because tomorrow I want to do the experiment and I forgot to think about it before. And I can think, can I do it in a way of not using 20 plates, but just one plate and I do 20 spottings on this, right? And all these kind of things. There's a lot of planning ahead, rethinking mm -hmm. uh, way you're doing your your experiments and your your lab work and all these things. Well, for those people who are not bioscientists, not in the lab, yeah. or how is this research impactful to the to the eco uh, ecosystem? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, one big thing is, of course, how is my institute built? Right. I mean, is it an old building? Um, can I do something there? Can I change for having uh, photovoltaic so Can solar panels. say like the institute the max frank institutes one of which mm. i did my work at they were rather new not even 10 years old and they were so energy inefficient like mm. it was like you know there was a third floor mostly glass um like not ceilings but also ceilings but also um walls it looked really fancy pants but first of all all the poor bird babies um, every spring there was like mass murder because they, as they were practicing to fly they were flying right into the glass because they couldn't see there's actually something there anyways so that's a drama but also the third level during summer they're being boiled and i'm not kidding you so how is that and whereas old buildings from the 60s and before that ten, tended or used to be so mm. well what is it like better if if not not all, I give you that. And usually the glass, um, what is it? Especially for us here in winter, mm -hmm. the the windows tend to be a bit leaking. So mm -hmm. but I, I hear you. So but what is it when research institutes usually left? Like old buildings versus new ones? Yeah, I mean the thing is it's probably better to not build a new building, but to maintain and to renovate your old building, right? Because uh -huh. also building a new building um costs a lot of energy and all these things that you're putting into even though it might be more uh, efficient afterwards but maybe you can get your current building already more efficient changing the windows for example if you say they are leaking why not putting new windows putting triple glass windows or not even, kind of that's it, because putting full new windows sometimes it's just enough to put some iso term yeah isolation to to to, yeah. to update this right mm -hmm. having movement detectors on the hallways right in the in the bathrooms and stuff like this oh, right yeah, not, the if somebody forgets to switch off the light then it's burning all night long all weekend long but you have a movement detector switches off the light automatically right mm -hmm. all these kind of things um what else can you do at your institute i mean um if you have a canteen what kind of food do you serve? Is it local? Is it regional? Uh, do you have vegan vegetarian options, which is also shown um, to reduce massively uh, the, the, the carbon footprint, right? Yeah. So all these kind of things can reduce. Do I need to, let's say I have a lot of computers uh, in my institute running the servers or whatever, they're producing a lot of heat. Do I have an option to use that heat, for example, in winter to heat also my institute, mm -hmm. that it's not just wasted heat? This can be things, right? This can be stuff that can be done. Do I need to have now with the energy crisis? Of course, a lot of people are interested in how can I save energy um, with the freezers, with all these kind of things, but also reducing the heating temperature, right? Um, modernizing things, um, yeah, all these kind of of steps can that you can do, right? The, you you already mentioned, I think, at the beginning, uh, mobility. How do I get to work? How do I, 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 maybe I have to travel over the campus. Do I have to have an institute car or can I have an institute bike, maybe an e-bike or something like this? Or having bikes, 
it's still a thing they used to do them like i think my the parent generation of us they yeah. already do it out of necessity and now we can also do it to be nice to our mother planet <laughs> So, yeah, or well, I mean, then having bikes, bike stands, mm -hmm. uh, which have a rain cover, great to have, right? It's really nice to your employees also. And what you can do with bike stands, you can put solar panels on top if they are in the right place, right? And and thinking out about these things, yeah, and maintaining bikes. Um, I know an institute here in Heidelberg, they did a, a bike maintenance day, right? So everybody could come with their bike, they got a bike check, um, or doing then a, a participating at, at company biking uh, events and all these kind of things, right? You need to get your people motivated and uh, interested in joining, right? We did a, a garden uh, with a green team here. So we set up um, a special area where we were planting plants, which is something visual, but also something, um, yeah, people can relate to more plants in the in the offices and stuff like this, if possible, and all, all these and things. Like the whole, I want to point this out or highlight this um, a bit more because it's a whole other category of what you, how you can green, literally green the institute and the campus at, at large. So first of all, have more plants in the building because it also helps the atmosphere inside the building. But outside, like I was pleasantly surprised when I visited my home, my, the institute I was working at for my PhD a couple of years later, they had rearranged um, the, gar the the campus and they've they've created a rather big recreational area with a pond. You could hear the frogs walking and whatever the English term is. There were fish in the pond and all kinds of... So for a bioscience institute, that makes a lot of sense because we study biology. We want to see biology happening in front of our eyes. Like normally institutes are pretty sterile inside and outside but here like and also it's so much better for the well-being people can just step outside the building like literally not to have to walk to a park which is 10 minutes away but literally outside the building sit on a bench um watch the bees the grasshoppers do their thing mm -hmm. um see the flowers going nuts and all colorful and it's so good for the soul and helps to get you through the day with a boring bipet bipeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also, I mean, in the end, it's also making you more attractive as an employee, right? Um, I think there are many people searching also for job opportunities where they can do something more sustainable and be in a working environment that cares, right, about their workers. I mean, sustainability in the end, we're talking about a lot about uh, ecological sustainability, but in the end, it's also about sustainability of the people working, the working atmosphere, wow. about making research more sustainable in a way of also, uh, yeah, conserving the experiments we're doing and the knowledge. Yeah, um, and avoiding the brain drain and people change positions yeah. every other year. There's a lot of knowledge going elsewhere. If you see their studies on reproducibility of experiments and so on, right? I mean, why is that also sometimes because I have lab books which are written hand manually, nobody else can read and understand and stuff like this, right? So also digitalization in this sense can sometimes or often make a lot of uh, yeah impact as well, right? If you have cross um, linkages, you have really service where the data is stored and you know how to, to grab it mm -hmm. and how also people can then work on the same space, even if they're on different locations and they can really better see what was done, how it was done. Sometimes people can then even have a QR code on there, their chemicals can scan what they used and so on. So, you know, the lot number, the chemical and so on and so forth, right? It makes it easier to reproduce stuff and so on. But this of course needs also time and um, you need to make your people aware of how can I use it? And it's something more long-term thing, right? So for sustainable measures, you often see also what are the low-hanging fruits or things I can easily do and already have an impact and then the long-term goals. And this is also something you need to, you find a balance, right? Also how you get people on board. You need to see, you can get them motivated. It's a, it's really also something that, I mean, because why, why I'm doing this, right? I mean, because I do an impact, but also in the end, it makes fun. It makes fun talking about it to affect people also trying something to 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 interact to yeah really move something and that can be also so uh give you so much joy about it right that i mean a lot of the people they're doing this in their free time right because they're not doing that while they are having the job and stuff like this so i'm also doing this 
in my free time next to my job and so on. But it's still, it's it's like a hobby. It makes so much fun and it's great to, yeah, to talk about it, to infect people, to see what can we move together, right? To know also this, I'm not alone in doing that. Um, yeah. So that you're you're heading to the next question I was going to ask you anyway. So so you find it enjoyable. You enjoy the process. You 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 get a lot of motivation out of the activities themselves. How's the response? The dog. How's the response of other How's people? The response by people that you talk to first. I think I assume there's quite a bit of reluctance first. Like yes, that's important, but what can I do? And this is how we're doing it, and always done it, and. First of all, um, maybe as much as you have seen, but just a generation before, the things were really done differently and more sustainably, because people didn't know, didn't just didn't waste because there was no, first of all, no incentive for need and also not no opportunity to waste so, as much as we do nowadays. But mm -hmm. but then as you get them into the process, how soon or what is it like how, when do you see they're changing the attitude towards the topic and also maybe when the spark heads over to them the spark of joy is like oh now i see what i can do and now i see how it's actually also rewarding and and fun to do it i think one really important step is to set the barriers low right to see what can i do in order to achieve something and to really do something and it doesn't mean always I need to stop what I'm doing and I need to change everything completely. And uh, it's like, okay, what can I do? Um, yeah, what makes fun? How do I get the people together? And a lot of people have different motivations, right? So I know things changed because of um, the, the, the management changed, right? Or because people were changing their minds because their kids were going to the Fridays for Future de uh, demonstrations, right? So they were confronted with it. So they were starting to think about it and they say like, yeah, actually I can also do something and then start doing doing things. And that's a little bit we're also trying, right? To not try to push people into, you need to do something because it's also important and, and so on, but to to get them on board, to see, okay, what are, what what do they think of? What is their, um, yeah, how to make it easy for them to start with us? How, how to... do you do that? Sorry to cut you short there, but that's what everybody <laughs> says. But how do you convince somebody to start something they feel reluctant about? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, something small, something you can do today, actually not today, but now, to mm -hmm. have a quick feeling of accomplishment, to see and learn that it's actually not painful to do this differently. And it's actually also efficient in doing it this way, rather than how we saw before. I mean, it might be... Maybe it's another five minutes to invest, but it's already seeing today or 30 minutes down the line, how it's saving your time in the long run. Something like that. Do you have an example or two that you can share? Yeah. Mm, so one thing, I mean, maybe you, you're aware of this this nudging uh, thing. The, the nudging is like, it's not, not you're manipulating people, but you're getting people um, in the end to do things because they want to do it and stuff like this, right? So you have like a mm -hmm. cartoon on, on the waste bin explaining you how to put, which kind of waste you're putting in there and stuff like this, right? And people stopping by, they read the, the cartoon, they find it funny, learn something about something, in this case of uh, what to, to recycle there, mm -hmm. and then they start doing it, right? Or just having the sticker on the machine, and then they think of, oh yeah, I'll switch it off, right? Without further ado further or, I'll need to tell them, ah, you didn't switch off your computer yesterday. You should definitely do that to save energy and stuff like this. Uh, I think it must be these small steps to make it easier yeah. for the people to do it, right? To, to have these kind of things and then to do an event, right? I mean, I heard of another um, institute, they were doing um, a run around the, the campus, collecting waste together uh, and celebrating in the end all the waste they collected, right? Um, and all these kind of things, right? There's something easy to do. It's something you can start right right away. Also with the garden, right? It's something people can enjoy. Um, a colleague of mine, she did a tour um, through the, the grass area around the institute showing what kind of plants actually are growing there, what kind of benefits they have. And people joined and were super interested in, in, in what kind of things they can learn and um, what is growing already out there. And that it's not just... Uh, what's the English phrase for uncalled? I don't know. So plants uh, you don't. They call them Sorry? weeds, but yeah, in German we call it like what's called? 
Was yeah, like, I have no clue. Is it plants, the plants you don't want to be growing there, or you think it there? Yeah, I don't know. Unwanted, unwanted plants. plants. <laughs> it's like a no plant, but it is a plant. Like, like the German translation really doesn't make sense. And I keep telling everyone mm. it's not a Unkraut, um, but it's a wild one. <laughs> so yeah. Let it be. It's supposed to be here. What it shows this spot. So <laughs> no, I don't know. Also, it has a function. Like probably it's probably yeah. growing here because the soil just provides the the appropriate mix of nutrients. So. Yeah, absolutely. And also, anything green actually helps um, convert the carbon kind of. I mean, not convert the carbon to oxygen, but kind of you know the whole turnover. Yeah. Um, Carbon, um, carbon is, trapping anything green traps carbon from the atmosphere so no matter how small that is exactly be. also it has an effect on the the air in the lab if you have a green plant or something like this right it definitely all have weeds and in instead of these potted plants which probably yeah. exotic which needs to be flown in or or grown in heated what is the greenhouses let's just grow weed in the lab <laughs> can also look beautiful no absolutely and then in, in the end you need to be an example right you need to say like okay this is the way i want to do it and that's you can explain to the people why you are doing it right because you feel good about it and doing it and you just do it and people see it and people seem like ah what he she is doing it's actually not so difficult i could also do that i make sense uh easy to do if i sort my my samples better in the minus 80 freezer i find them quicker uh that's actually cool. I should also do that, right? And then people are less reluctant of doing it. It's like, oh, I need to clean up. Yeah, I need to sort. Uh, also, uh, you know you have to clean up anyway. So now that everybody's doing it, let's just get to work and get it done with. So yeah. uh, the group effect and the group motivation also help. Yeah, yeah. And then you celebrate afterwards together. Um, have a nice day. Have a nice, nice lab outing or something. Um, and that even more creates yeah community creates exchange creates joy of what you were doing right and this then will accumulate uh, and also just this assessment right if you don't see in the end what you did and what it had what, what kind of was the impact mm -hmm. it's less grabbable right if i just exchange the windows i see the bill mm -hmm. and i see okay exchange the window for ten thousand euro mm -hmm. if i also check what this may have done with uh, my heating costs that they were reduced then I see, okay, wow, it really made in, made a difference, right? Yeah. If I compare this, this um, lab waste day, um, every year in September, they were doing this, posting pictures on social media about the lab waste they were collecting and then calculating actually what does that mean when I produce every day 200 grams, 2.5 kilograms of plastic waste, what do that mean in the long term for a year of plastic waste that I'm producing? And then if I start changing something and then I can measure it again. And then it's instead of 200, just 100 grams. I know, okay, wow, this is the impact I had. And that makes me feel good because I achieved something. And this is all kind of stuff. I mean, everybody has different motivations and everybody has different ways of approaching things. But I think whatever person you can, you can find there, there's no one, one, one recipe that fits all, uh, but you can try and you need to play around a bit and not get frustrated because people might not join immediately or they need some time, right? Some people also, they need to see it first or they need to experience it. Um, like in the Institute, they they were looking at us as PhDs and they want to change something. But then they, they we started communicating. They saw what we were doing. We were doing some nice stuff. They see, oh, it's not such a big change. It's actually quite easy. It uh, helps the Institute. Um, mm -hmm. It's a good way. We produce, um, do something so yeah let's do it and then they start supporting us and that's also where it needs to come together in the end because not just a grassroots organization can do it all everything alone they need to be support from the top down uh, of an institute as well and they need to work together find solutions and see what they can do together and then addressing long-term goals setting milestones setting things they can reach together wow. getting carbon neutral all these kind of things but also find ways of how to get carbon neutral, not just saying, okay, I get carbon neutral until 2040. How do I do that, right? Mm -hmm. And how can I find ways of approaching milestones on the way there? Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's so exciting to hear all of these activities going on and all the possible actions taken and actually being taken. 
Um, so how can we scale this? Um, so one question would be, and that's not an easy one to answer, I guess, um, can answer myself, but you can also very much add your five cents. So where do you see the most potential for scalability of lowering environmental impact through research practices? So is there one practice which has a lot of impact in carbon emission and which we can easily change and revert or so and that again as you said before depends on the discipline and the practice and who's yeah so i think it's a bit of a complex answer and we already did this in a way um but the other question would be i had another approach to this where do you see where, yeah which are the activities maybe one or two or three or what's the what's the one activity that most people easily change uh, do embrace and was like and feel really proud of in changing a habit and doing something good like you know what what's the is what's the lowest hanging fruit for everyone <laughs> what's the low hanging fruit i mean also there for everyone is always a difficult thing but um i mean people. switching off stuff is super easy right if i think about yeah, but to do that once in a workshop is easy, but then to also actually change the habit because you have it's clicked in your head and now you want to change it. If you forget it once, it's mm -hmm. actually bothering you while you're lying in bed at home. And then you're making sure there's not you're not forgetting again because it clicked. Like, you know, that kind of feeling. That's a really, really, really tough one, I would say, right? I mean, there's uh, changing habits is probably also the the thing that makes a lot of people struggle with it, right? It's like a New Year's resolution. I'll do more sports from January on. And I do that the first week. I forget it the eighth day. And then it's like, okay, then it starts tripling away. I think for right? habit changing, you need you, you, your system, our brains need 80 something, 86 or something touch points. So you have to go to the gym 80 something times before it's easy. Like, you you know, there's always this reluctance, this hesitation, like, should I really go? Oh, so much effort. But this changes after, because then your system is primed to that. It's a, apparently research shows, I try and find the evidence <laughs> in more than one paper, um, that, yeah, it takes that many re occurrences. But, mm -hmm. But oh, in other words, where do you see what, what's the what's the biggest insight or not the biggest insight, but where do people have a realization of, yeah, I haven't thought of that. And that's actually easy. And let me try to do that without actually measuring if they are following through. Mm -hmm. mm. So I think, I mean, if you have minus 80 freezers, putting it to minus 70 is definitely an easy thing to do, right? I mean, it's just changing the temperature. You just need to make sure about your samples. Um, and downscaling, I would say, definitely. If I do my experiment smaller, if I think about my experiment and how I'm doing it, this is an easy thing to do. And this, I anyway need to think about my experiment, what I'm doing, and then I can also incorporate, do I have to use, I don't know, 50,000 plates for that? Can I do that on a smaller scale, right? High throughput uh, is great, but doesn't need to say, like, okay, I'll try everything I can try, right? It's also like thinking about what I'm doing, what I'm trying. Yeah, and um, just because many people will go like, yeah, but reproducibility and we need the numbers, blah, blah, blah. So it's, of course, a trade-off. But you need to be research integer in both, in both directions for sustainability, yes, reduce the numbers, but also for the actual research, reproducibility and um, replicability or to avoid false positives. Of course, you need a certain relatively high number, depending on your experimental setup, to to know that the results you get most of the time are actually true um and not false positive but mm -hmm. but that's for the researcher and the group together like whoever's knowledgeable about the project setup or the research setup to assess but not to do as many as you can just because you can and have the money for that's what we're talking yeah. about right i think also an interesting approach on this topic, I don't know if you heard about it, is slow science, right? That we need to change a little the systems in the way of how we approach science. Mm -hmm. That it's not about all this pressure of publishing as fast as possible, um, but maybe, yeah, results you don't trust even yourself to, uh, into detail, right? So it's really about thinking about the science process. How do we address science? How do we do science? 
must it be in the way we are doing it? Or Does can it, it have be, to be this experiment that's so wasteful? Do we have a better another experiment that's less wasteful but gives us more information as an outcome? For example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I mean, taking out the pressure, right? Sharing more knowledge, thinking about incorporating people, combining our efforts, combining our uh, strength is, I mean, we, we saw it also with the development of the, the vaccine, right? If you combine forces, can go faster things, right? But I mean, this is a little bit about also how the system needs to change, mm. right? It's not about this this pressure of being the first in as shortest time as possible. This is a long-term goal. This is not something you can easily reach. And this is something that really needs a transformation of the whole uh, system and how, how science is done in a way, right? To really produce what needs to be done in a way that is sustainable and, yeah, um, I say, uh, has more impact, right? Impactfulness and sustainability. This needs to be improved. Mm. I have a good news. A friend and colleague of mine, Paola Mazuzzo, who's also been on this podcast before, she, ha she, she has slides on the module on slow science, open science. So cool. I'll bring that in the show notes. And yeah, sure definitely more resources. So go, go and check it out, audience, <laughs> listener, <laughs> and you. Uh, and I also send it to you. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any, Any final statements? It. We've learned a lot already. I always, I always enjoy talking about this topic because there's always something more that also I learn, and I thought I already know quite a bit, but there's also something. What did I learn today from you on the spot? Um, I think some of the initiatives you mentioned, which we now have in the show notes, um, certainly the references, I've collected a few and, oh yeah, I'm also putting together a Zotero, um, so we, we'll have a Zotero collection. Do you, do you have resources somewhere listed on your website? Well, of course, on the website for the sustainability network. So, so yeah, also research on these research, reducing carbon, footprints in research topic. Um, yeah. Let me make sure to, to add some of the stuff I, I mentioned. If you find anything I, which is not in the show note at that point, I'm happy to share it also. Um, yeah, it's all I out there. I collected while we were talking. So the clicking that you've heard, that's me putting the references. The... Adding up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite a bunch of things. And there, I mean, that's also a good, the good message, right? That there's, more and more research out there and more and more sources out. Um, great collections of ideas, also Green Your Lab. Um, they have a nice database of what you can do you know, to achieve greener labs. I mean, there are certifications, what you can also do now to get your labs uh, greener. I mean, I can highly recommend checking out the LEAF um, approach on getting your, your lab more sustainable. They have now more than uh, 1,600 labs signed up and more than 1,000 labs already certified. Um, My Green Labs also does a certification program. You can also check that out on their website as well as the Freezer Challenge there, right? Uh, so there's so many databases of things that are coming out. There's now nice publications about comparing plastic towards a uh, glass lab where uh, what is more sustainable, when is it more sustainable, um, all these kind of things. I, I highly recommend checking that out. There's so many sources out also to, to share, right? If you tried something, didn't work out, also share, share that, not just about the research, but also about sustainability measures you did and tried, right? It's a good thing about exchanging. A lot of the suppliers also changing now the way they're sending samples. They're partially of them, they're re recycling or you can send back packaging material. Um, they're using new uh, materials of producing their, their, their uh, their the lab where uh, reducing the thicknesses of uh, pipe tips of losing less plastic for that and all these things oh, right. Can we add that? That's my favorite topic because that really drove me nuts. Um, the pipe tips. A very yeah. good university where you don't have as much money for buying more and more pipe and just wasting them. Um, once after yeah. use, you can just wash an article of them like still today. There's no need. On the on the on the um of what, what you're doing. I mean, I have colleagues who say they're doing RNA work, so for them it's really tricky. But now, okay, I think, on your but most people can, and like uh, where sure. I'm working, everybody yeah. was just wasting them. And you, yeah, yeah, I know that also a lot. I mean, tubes for sure. Also, depending on what you put inside, right? If you label them and use the same chemical over and over again, that's all fine. You can clean it. There's now a company 
um, that also sells uh, tip cleaning machines, right? Mm -hmm. This is a little investment, but you can clean your pipe tips in this machine. And they have also a bunch of references on what they tested and that it's really, yeah, almost like new the tips and you can really wash them mm -hmm. a number of cycles uh, and reuse them and reuse them and reuse them. And, of yeah, course, and instead this of buying yet another equipment piece, like what, you know, autoclave, every modern lab, usually on yeah. most modern labs have autoclaves and maybe you can just build something to put inside the autoclave to not to have to buy a new machine, which does the same thing. Kind of I think thing. Let's put it out there. We don't have to go into the details, but um, yeah. I like think I mean universities, out of necessity, they had to be innovative about what they already have and get the job done. Whereas in institutions where you have so much money extra or left over at the end of the year and just buy another machine, do we need something? No, let's just anyways buy something because otherwise the money will go to waste or whatever. <laughs> so, um, also something that I think should change, right? It you have this right. pressure well. of spending the money, right? It's like, why not, if I saved money and worked more efficient with the money I had, and why- Hire one PhD student for, <laughs> or librarian. Yeah, yeah, it's done right now, it's not possible, but this is something, I mean, for some of the stuff, it's important also that law changes, right? That there is some movement in the way that science is funded, that science is treated, that things are run, that also some guidelines, right? That you always have to buy the cheapest, um, and maybe not the most sustainable and so on, right? What kind of energy is my, my institute consuming? Can I switch to a sustainable supplier? All these kind of things. I, there's also some rules and guidelines that need to change and they will change over the time that I'm, I'm quite... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But there you know, mentioned something important also within an institute, within a research group, everybody has a say, has an experience, have some ideas, has some ideas. And it's just important to put our heads together and talk about the issues that are important for us personally, but also um, for the planet and us as a species on this planet and for also, yeah, all kinds of things. But so communication and, and it's also about a matter of research integrity. That's why I grouped it as a topic in my courses or in our courses at Access to Perspective. So expect more of that topic to come your way if you follow us um and you Jan, you're also of course most welcome to come come again and share more of your wisdom with us and what okay. else we can do it's been a pleasure being here sharing some of my insights i'm, I'm looking forward for comments and yeah people who show what they are doing what they think about the topic what their approaches are um what works for them right i mean stay curious if Anyone who I can could, uh, yeah, now in fact with being excited about doing research more sustainable, mm -hmm. I'm absolutely happy about this. And this is something we should spread. So go out, share uh, what you learn. There are so many also now talks about seminars, lectures, you can check out, mm -hmm. um, definitely do that. Try to learn um, and get excited and, and share this with your colleagues and bring it out yeah. in your lab, in your institutes. And also share your own experiences with us, anything that we haven't mentioned that you think is important and you've seen and actually implemented in your research group, please, please let us know. So we, we need to hear success stories and activities everybody's doing already so much. And it's important that we talk about the good stuff that we're doing. Um, and yeah, so get in touch with Jan. The contact details will be also accessible for you or are as we speak. And um, I'm also always happy to hear from you. And we can come back together anytime in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you.